understand the reasons. Obviously, it's it's gut wrenching. There's no doubt. I'm a mother, and um, I'm also as a police officer. I have worked um, on Indigenous files with missing and murders, so I, I have had a firsthand, um, you know, knowledge of that. The campaign event was a promise of ten million dollars to support women fleeing domestic violence. While outside, protesters shouted, "Search the landfill." Before the PC ads were published, Manitoba Liberal leader Dougal Lamont weighed in on the landfill issue during a sit-down with APTN. But this should never have been a political issue at all. This is just something that should have been part of a police budget. We don't have a referendum like this on whether people have a, a murder investigation happen or not. Um, so it, it's, this has been a truly terrible, it's one of the worst things I've ever seen, quite honestly, in, in politics, that this is being used as a wedge issue in an election year. Uh, to make people pick and choose uh, when really we should be standing on the side of victims of crime. APTN yeah, Truth and Politics um, panelist Nigan Sinclair says Fairmont. this style of ad appeals to certain people. What we're seeing is a wide scale approach uh, and desperate times call for desperate measures. Uh, what you're seeing is a very desperate conservative party who is only appealing to the very base level of voter uh, and the very base level of the voter is the question, will you vote for an Indigenous leader? Will you vote for women? Will you vote for a party that supports LGBTQ people? That's really what the appeal is in these attack ads. Meanwhile, the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs says human rights violations are prevalent in the PC leader's slogan, Stand Firm, a reference to her decision not to back a landfill search. It's been a long, hard journey to try and convince, to try and convince politicians that uh, the lives of our women do matter. The lives of any person matters, and I don't know how, how what much more I can say to, to do that. The Liberals have promised to fund um, at least half the cost of the landfill kind of search, uh, which is pegged at around 184 million, with the NDP committing to funding a search but not giving a number. Manitobans will have the final say when they go to the polls October 3rd. And we'll have a deeper look at the issue coming up a little later in our newscast with the Truth and Politics panel. A man from the Siksika Nation in southern Alberta has filed a human rights complaint against a hospital and Alberta Health Services following the death of his wife. According to the complaint, she was not given proper treatment leading up to her death. Siksika chief and council say the incident is a result of systemic racism and are calling for change in Alberta's healthcare system. APTN's Tamara Pimentel has the details. Her death was preventable. In a press conference on Thursday, Ben Crowchief relives the experience of losing his wife, Myra Crowchief, in April of 2022. He says her death could have been prevented had she been provided proper care at a hospital in Strathmore, the closest hospital to their home community of Siksika Nation in southern Alberta. I feel she would still be alive and her concerns would have been taken seriously. Ben submitted a complaint to the Alberta Human Rights Commission against Strathmore District Health Services and Alberta Health Services. According to the complaint, the couple had experienced discriminatory treatment on April 17, 2022, when Myra was brought to hospital by ambulance for intense pain in her abdomen. The complaint states Myra remained in the emergency department at Strathmore Hospital for the next seven hours and was ignored by hospital staff. She kept in touch with Ben while he was at home caring for their children. She told Ben no one was checking in on her or treating her pain, and she was discharged without any prescriptions. A CT scan was done at the hospital in Strathmore. It showed evidence of active abdominal bleeding. But no one told the couple until Myra went to Foothills Hospital in Calgary. I wish no one else had to go through what we went through. She was admitted on April 20th, 2022, 
and died the following day. So you doesn't get to see your kids grow up, or her grandkids. She should have been treated differently. In March 2022, Siksika Chief and Council began collecting stories of discrimination in health care from its members. Far too long Chief Ore Crowfoot says a steady behavior. flow of complaints have been made and the Crow Chief's experience is just one of many stories being brought to light. Far too long we've been subject to racist and discriminatory behavior while receiving health care. For too long we have been insulted we were when we were at our most vulnerable. APTN has reached out to Alberta Health Services for a comment. We did not hear back before airtime. Ben says he wants to see change within Alberta's health care system to prevent similar stories from happening in the future. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Winnipeg. We want to hear what you think about any of the stories you've heard tonight. Here's how to continue the conversation. To read and watch our stories, go to aptnnews.ca. If you have a story you want to share, send us an email to news at aptn.ca. And you can find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X, previously known as Twitter. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. A lawsuit filed by Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations officials in Saskatchewan last month against former Chief Electoral Officer Myrna Osu-Bushi has revealed that current FSIN Chief Bobby Cameron may not have been eligible to run in the 2021 FSIN election. In her statement of defense, Osu Bushy says she's learned of Cameron's criminal conviction and brought it up before the 21 uh, 2021 election. She was then let go from her role as electoral officer. APTN has confirmed that Cameron was convicted of theft in a break and enter in 1993. He was first elected FSIN chief in 2015. Section 44B of the FSIN Election Act says, in part, a person shall be ineligible as a candidate for an executive position if he or she has been convicted of fraud, theft, or a breach of trust. There's no time limit on that section of the Act. Chief Cameron could not be reached for comment today. A series of cultural sites belonging to a First Nation in the Yukon are now part of the prestigious UNESCO World Heritage List. The Trondek Klondike World Heritage Site is a series of properties made up of eight distinct locations covering more than 300 hectares. The Trondek Gwich'in First Nation says the area is unique because of its First Nation and settler history. UNESCO, or the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, recognizes places on Earth that offer outstanding universal value to humanity. A World Heritage designation is eligible to receive, receive funding for protection and conservation because of its special status. Trondike Klondike will help protect our lands and tell our stories. Trondike Klondike World Heritage Site provides Trondike Wichin and the rest of our community with another opportunity to connect with our lands and act as stewards to share the lessons of these lands and speak for the animals. A Senate committee is examining new legislation this week that aims to tighten Canada's bail system. The government says the old bail system contained gaps which allowed offenders charged with serious crimes to exploit it. But critics say the new legislation will only increase the mass over-incarceration of Indigenous people in Canadian jails. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. Around the table to introduce themselves beginning on my left. Testifying before the Senate Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs earlier this week, Justice Minister Araf Varani assured members the legislation will not increase the number of Indigenous people behind bars. We've taken great lengths as a government to ensure that, this, that the over-representation piece is being addressed uh, for Indigenous as well as uh, Black uh, individuals in Canada who are over-represented greatly. And I can point you to many examples, but I'll just point you to, to a couple 
couple right now. One is Bill C-5, which dealt with mandatory minimum penalties and the fact that those were resulting in uh, the over-incarceration of black and indigenous persons. I'm currently working on an indigenous justice strategy with indigenous leaders. Bill C-48 expands the number of charges where an accused must demonstrate they are not a threat to public safety when seeking bail. These include a variety of firearms offenses, violent offenses involving a weapon, and intimate partner violence. On Thursday, Krista Bigknew of the Indigenous Bar Association told the same committee that changes will lead to an increased number of Indigenous women pleading guilty to charges they may have previously contested. There is potential harm, particularly to Indigenous women, as it relates to prior charges of intimate partner violence, knowing that Indigenous women and Indigenous individuals will often plead out, even when they're not guilty, because the consequences are less serious than when they are convicted in a trial. She also said the reforms will ensure fewer Indigenous women are granted bail. Dual charging often results in women who find themselves either in poverty or in circumstances potentially of more serious domestic violence facing the criminal justice system in a way that the reverse onus will be very difficult for them. We already know that Indigenous people uh, do not receive bail at the same rate as others. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. We have to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll hear from our Truth and Politics panel. Back after this. Welcome back. As we heard earlier in our newscast, the provincial election campaign in Manitoba is into its final days. 
Voters go to the polls Tuesday, October 3rd, and the Conservatives have launched a series of attack ads aimed at the NDP, especially their leader, Wab Kinu. Winnipeg Free Press columnist Negan Sinclair and Eagle Feather News Editor-in-Chief Carrie Benjo are here now for this week's Truth and Politics panel. Okay, Negan, you've been quoted. The progressive conservatives are desperate. Could you expand on that? Well, the past few days here in Manitoba have been very clear that the Conservative strategy is not to build the house, but to save what's in it. And what that means is, is they've got a block vote of 30%-ish uh, that they're trying to appeal to, to shore up, to make sure that they maintain themselves in between 17 and 20 seats. And they, it's a Hail Mary pass to hope that there's enough people in Manitoba who think Wab Canoe is a criminal, uh, can never be forgiven, and that Indigenous peoples aren't to be trusted uh, in be making decisions on their own remains and landfills and so on like that. That. And so, so what's happening is that the Conservatives are no longer looking for that kind of centre, moderate vote. They're looking for a hard vote and those who are feeling anti-reconciliation. Okay, Carrie, the PCs are saying that the Manitoba New Democrats will open the floodgates for crime. Uh, will this convince enough people to vote for Heather Stephenson? No, because even that sentiment is not... Um, founded in reality. I've looked at the NDP platform and he has a clear idea of where he wants to go when it comes to crime. And I think that um, what he's proposing, I think that it shows opportunity for what he's trying to accomplish and saying that, oh, he's going to open the floodgates for crime. Um, I think that's just another grasp to um, say that he doesn't have the abilities to do what needs to be done. Right. Uh, so for both of you, the timing of this ad campaign, Saturday is Orange Shirt Day for children who survived and who didn't survive the residential schools. Uh, the NDP have several First Nation and Métis candidates. Is it a good idea to attack them this way at this time? And Nigan will ask you first. Well, I mean, what Kerry just said is absolutely the NDP has a plan. It isn't to make more police officers, though, or hire more police officers. It's to shore up mental health services. They're not looking at cutting the police, but what they're doing is is keeping the existing police force, maybe strengthening it somewhat, uh, but then particularly building what they call wraparound support, so housing, uh, mental health facilities, and so on. Um, and so what that tells you is that the attack on Wab Canoe and inferring that he's going to somehow open the floodgates is also that he's a criminal. And so a long time, all of those ads is endless reminders and trying to get the media to point out to the public uh, around these ads. The reason that they're putting these ads out is so that all of us in the media then say, here's what the ads say. And they say they remind that he has a previous DUI and all these kinds of things, many things that he's been pardoned for. And the real question is, is is Manitoba voters ready for someone to give a second chance to? Um, you know, certainly if he was a non-Indigenous person, a Canadian male, for example, undoubtedly he would get second, third, fourth chances. And how many politicians, Rob Ford, you look in the United States, Donald Trump, you know, all these people get second, third, 50,000 chances. Yep. And if you're an Indigenous person, you never get a second chance. And, I, and that's the real question is, are Manitoba voters ready for a person with, who deserves a second chance on Tuesday? Yep. And Carrie, do you have anything to say to that? Um, just going off with Nigan said, as for Orange Shirt Day, I think this really just highlights um, where the 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 party stands when it comes to Indigenous people, and and I think it's just showing voters who they're voting for if they do vote for that party. Yeah. All right, we'll have to leave it there. But thank you very much for joining us today, both of you, and have a great day. You watch. Thanks. It will indeed be an interesting election day in Manitoba. Another break now, but we'll tell you about an Indigenous Youth Forum happening in Ottawa when we come back.
Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Shelley Morin sent in this great shot of the setting sun as seen from Nipawin, Saskatchewan, regional park located about four hours due north of Regina. Beautiful area. Thanks for sharing, Shelley. If you have a photo to share, send it to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. On the East Coast, we're looking at St. John's at 16 tomorrow, Fredericton 21. Newfoundland Labrador, Happy Valley Goose Bay 16. In Quebec, Shibugamu 21 and St. Jovite 24. In Ontario, North Bay and Peterborough and Toronto, all 22. Northern Ontario, we're looking at Big Trout Lake 20 and Sioux Lookout 18. Northern Manitoba, Churchill 20 tomorrow, Puckatawagan 15. Southern Manitoba, Barrens River and Princess Harbor 19, Winnipeg 21. Southern Saskatchewan, Yorkton 20, Regina 18 and Saskatoon also 18. Further north, Uranium City 7 and La Ronge 15. In Northern Alberta, High Level 10, Fort McMurray 12. Heading south, Edmonton and Calgary 12, Medicine Hat 18. Southern BC, Kamloops 16 and Vancouver 15. In northern BC, Dease Lake and Fort Nelson 10, Smithers 14. Rock River minus 1 tomorrow, and Whitehorse partly cloudy in 7. In the Northwest Territories, Norman Wells 5, Fort Simpson 8. Further north, Tuktoyuktuk 2, and Inuvik 4. Cambridge Bay minus 1 and some snow tomorrow, and Baker Lake is 5. Resolute, minus three tomorrow, and Iglulik, zero. Thousands of youth from the Ottawa region heard from residential school survivors and knowledge keepers today at a youth-focused event. It was an opportunity to learn about Canada's history with a visit by Governor General Mary Simon. Here's Annette Francis with that story. Over 5,000 kids donning orange shirts packed the TD Place Arena in Ottawa, where they heard an honor song, followed by Juno Award winner Julie Black's version of O Canada. O Canada, our home on a native land. They've come to learn about the impacts of the residential school system. It's the second year for the Gidduenimum, or We Are All Related event. Jennifer Wood of the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation says there's been a great response. I believe that we had over four million uh, viewers and we had again over thousands of students attending from surrounding communities so it's growing and growing and you know we want to build it mu as much as we can because it's time it's a pivotal time in our history for survivors uh, in spite of everything that's happening with the discoveries and you know recognizing orange shirt day and the reconciliation in general i mean Canada is uh, listing and, and, and we appreciate it as survivors. Governor General Mary Simon encouraged the youth to listen and learn. It's up to you to say in one powerful voice, I will tell others what you tell me today. I will be shaped by what I hear. We will do better for each other. Today, let us build bridges of understanding, respect, healing and reconciliation because each of us must contribute to our collective journey of reconciliation in big and small ways. It was also an opportunity to hear from residential school survivors. First Nations people were here for thousands and thousands of years. The truth is, we lived here very, very well for thousands and thousands of years. We didn't need the newcomers to come and teach us how to live. 
There were cultural dances as well. According to Wood, it's something survivors can take pride in. And at Francis Aikatan National News, Ottawa. And that is all we have for you tonight. Thanks for joining us.